Just a few days ago, it became crystal clear to anyone that had any doubt how little the economic system cares about workers. Now, you and I probably knew that, but now there's a number that we can attach to that as well. The story is simple. Smithfield Foods, which is a massive pork processor making billions of dollars every year, did almost nothing to stop hundreds of workers from getting sick from COVID-19. And in fact, four workers died at its Sioux Falls, South Dakota plant. This was all predictable. The union representing many of the workers warned early on that the plants were unsafe, and that's the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. As I've talked about in the show for many months, animal food processing plants, pork, beef, and poultry top any list of the most dangerous places to work, and that's without a pandemic. The speed of the production lines is unbearable for normal human beings, which is why these plants, again, on a quote-unquote good day, have sky-high rates on injuries, partly because workers are packed together, they breathe bad air, they're shoulder to shoulder, they're making really quick multiple cuts with very sharp knives on carcasses that are speeding by very, very quickly. And sometimes they actually cut each other accidentally. There is no such thing as social distancing in a pork processing plant because packing workers together is a way of maximizing profit. And what do you think comes first? Worker safety or corporate profits? That, of course, is a rhetorical question. So add in the virus and what you get is an ideal Petri dish for the rapid spread of COVID-19. Now, greedy companies didn't care about these dangers. To try to create safety, and I'm not kidding when I tell you this, some of these companies actually put up saran wrap in between workers to stop the virus from spreading. Saran wrap. So into the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, came OSHA to do an investigation about why hundreds of people were getting sick and four workers had died. Now, it's an agency that has very little teeth when it comes to enforcement. Fines have always been a pittance and a cost of doing business. But this story is especially mind-boggling in the midst of a global pandemic. So OSHA does its investigation. It interviews scores of people and lo and behold, finds a safety violation. Now, that wasn't a language mistake on my part. OSHA found a single safety violation. One, for which it's proposing to fine the company $13,494. Yes, for four workers dying and more than 1,300 infected workers between March 22nd and June 16th. And those workers, who knows how many they then infected in their communities, not to mention the trauma and the costs that are connected to those infections. All of that, and the company is going to pay a pittance. It's $3,373.50 for each worker killed, or a little over 10 bucks for the more than 1,300 who have been infected, including 43 who had to be hospitalized. Now, that fine, that proposed fine, is a green light for every company in the country to do virtually nothing to protect workers from COVID-19 because the message to them is there is no cost, no real cost, no serious cost to letting workers get sick or die. And here's an additional sleazy part of this. Kira Lombardo a spokeswoman for Smithfield Foods, called the citation, she really said this, quote, wholly without merit. And she told the whole world that the company had taken, quote, extraordinary measures to protect employees from infections. What a sick joke. But hey, people like that get paid lots of money to spew lies and immoral rubbish just to shill for corporations. So let's talk more about this with Jessica Martinez. Jessica was recently on the show talking about the fear workers face 
when they try to stand up at work and challenge unsafe conditions. You can see that show, as you can see all our shows in our archive, and do check it out. It was a great conversation. Jessica is the co-director of the National Council for Occupational Safety and Health. That stands for National COSH, a nationwide network that links the efforts of local worker health and safety coalitions and communities across the United States who are advocating for elimination of preventable hazards in the workplace. So I took out my calculator, which of course now everybody's calculator is on a phone, and I did this calculation of what this, what I would say, outrageous fine on the part of OSHA uh, against Smithfield, and I came to the calculation that every worker's death, all the four workers who died, from OSHA's standpoint, they are worth $3,358.50. And all the hundreds of workers who were made sick by the virus, over 1,300, as you point out, that's 10 bucks a worker, basically. And, I mean, to go to the point about the workers who were killed, to me, that was murderous behavior on the part of the company because they knew, they were warned, you know all this. But first, tell me what was your reaction when you first saw this number? I mean, you've been around this space for a very long time. Did this surprise you? You know, at first, I can tell that the information is completely outrageous. Um, It's really upsetting. But the unfortunate truth is that it is consistent with the history of federal OSHA Mm -hmm. in terms of slapping an employer. And it's a simple slap in the the wrist of what it what worker lives mean to this country. Um, OSHA has been essentially completely silent for six months, um, asleep at the wheel as the New York Times editorial presented earlier today. Um, And we know that a lot of employers as they're rushing to reopen in the midst of this pandemic are scraping and doing what they can to provide some or get to provide some protections for workers. Now, we know that there are very rich industries, very rich employers where profit and production takes priority over anything. And that the reality is that a lot of the most vulnerable worker populations, the industries that are mostly high hazard, um, such as the meatpacking industry, which has been a heavily impacted industry in the midst of this pandemic with thousands of workers uh, infected. uh, It's hard to even keep up with the number of fatalities. But we know that in a lot of these recent uh, companies that have been fined, a minuscule amount have had worker deaths. We know, you know, Smithfield in particular in South Dakota had thousands of worker infections, had over 50 hospitalizations, and we know four worker deaths. They got fined $13,000. That is nothing for a billion dollar industry. Mm. And we see this consistently happening, um, that there is no set standard. Most of the, there's no enforceable guidelines or enforceable standards for these employers. So they're doing whatever they can and it's a free for all, um, essentially of doing what they claim is some protections for workers. So uh, our position is that as, as it always has been, uh, that we're aware that OSHA is a completely undersourced a- agency, but they are truly doing the minimum in terms of even responding to the over 200 uh, over, the, pardon, over the 10,000 of worker complaints that have been submitted to OSHA. Mm. Um, and there has been very little, little citations. Um, like I said, it's taken them six months to just issue these really ridiculously um, small uh, citations for, for these employers in, in this industry itself. Now, I do want to circle back to the very important point you made that this is kind of the way OSHA has operated for a very long time. It's easy for many of us who are progressives to say, oh, this, this is the Trump folks. This is what they don't care. But the truth is that OSHA has been basically a shell of itself and really not functioning very well in workplaces for a very long time because it doesn't get the resources. But, you know, Smithfield specifically, the reason to me they're behavior is murderous and their conduct is deserving of not just a slap on the wrist, but jail time for these executives. They were warned about this. You had a union, as you well know, not to mention your important networks, but the United Food and Commercial Workers and the people who actually represent the workers to the at, at these plants, 
they've been telling people for months right after the pandemic started that the conditions not just in the pork processing facilities but in poultry and in beef were horrendous and we already know as you well know that these processing plants on a good day were dangerous places to work the air was bad the speed of the lines is too fast for a normal human being to function so from my point of view what what smithfield did and the reason this uh fine this pathetic fine really shines out is that smithfield knew what was going on right they knew and the reality is that finding them with such a small amount is really more of an incentive Absolutely. for these employers to do whatever they want for workers they know oh is this what it takes i mean we're still a billion dollar industry we're still able to pressure workers to work faster work in these terrible working conditions i mean again we're the the reality of, of the meat packing industry is that they're working in confined spaces they're using very poor quality uh, personal protective equipment. I mean, I've heard stories directly from workers inside these plants who are saying, we are having to use the same mask for over a period of two weeks. Mm. Um, we've had to do our own cleaning of the mask. If we don't bring our own, our, our own PPE, you know, we're out of luck. Um, there's these uh, fake sort of precautions that are not really enforceable or that are not really protecting workers. And, and that's the reality that true incentive um, for these workers to work faster and harder in the most unsafe working conditions, you know, imaginable. So. And I remember some of these pathetic steps that they wanted to take where they would put saran wrap up in, up in between workers. I remember these kind of crazy ideas. So the point is they knew actually that this virus was highly contagious when they took these steps. I'm not saying Smithfield specifically did Saran Wrap. I can't remember which company did. Maybe, maybe you remember that. But the fact is that the, it was well known that those uh, processing plants were Petri dishes, essentially, where that virus would spread quite, quite quickly. And so that's what makes their conduct even more outrageous. And not to get too much in the weeds, but was what was even more outrageous on the part of OSHA is that if they wanted to, even in their limited framework, they could have actually fined Smithfield for every single violation involving every single worker rather than just finding one single violation for that $13,000 and change. Am I right about that? That you are very right about that. There is complete inconsistency in the manner that they are even citing these employers. I mean, just a couple months ago, I think the first fine that was issued related to COVID was that at a nursing home in Ohio, they got they there was seven infections, no fatalities, and they were fined over forty thousand dollars. Okay, so we're talking about. I mean, it's still a small amount given the amount of infections, but the point is that there is no real logical consistency of how these employers are being fined. Again, you have thousands of workers infected, uh, in the hundreds hospitalized, worker fatalities, and you slap them in the wrist with a $13,000 fine. It's, it's, it's unconceivable. Now, we know that also Cal OSHA, for instance, for there's a couple of states, about 20 states across the country that have their own state plans, mm -hmm. in, such as the case of California, where you have Cal OSHA. Um, they did a confined, the latest fine that they provided in the first around COVID was for a total of $436,000 for Overhill Farms. Again, because they were able to separate each of the citations and not just uh, basically do one citation for, um, for the, the amount of infections and fatalities and, and the unsafe conditions. So again, it really speaks um, so much to the intentions of these of these citations, um, us at National Kosh, we have been working hand in hand with a lot of workers in several of these industries, trying to put pressure directly on employers to provide the safe conditions. We know that a lot of workers can continue to be retaliated against for speaking up around issues of safety and health. This is where we ask OSHA to step up in their responsibility to protect workers um, across the country, independent of the language they speak, of their immigration status, because we do know that a lot of these workers in many of these fields in, 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 in this industry, in particular, represent some of the most vulnerable worker populations that include uh, workers of color, immigrant workers, and so forth. So independent of that status 
of, of where you come from, the language that you speak. We're asking OSHA to do its due diligence in protecting workers and that also that they provide enforceable standards, not these recommended guidelines. Because if when you have guidelines, the likelihood is that employers that are prioritizing uh, profit and production um, will not be following proper health and safety standards. So um, it's really a mess. And we're hoping that, again, that our pressure, our work, our advocacy um, is empowering workers to make these demands directly with employers now that we know that um, the state, the federal agency that's in charge of this is really, you know, not taking a lot of action. And I wanted to not leave this point about the number of violations alone, because in addition, as you well know, and I want you to explain this, they could have decided to find that what Smithfield did was willful, a willful violation, which is the reason I set the table, pointing out that they knew that people knew about this, they had been warned about this. And there's a big difference, because if you're found to have willfully violated the law, then that fine could be a lot higher than just the, your sort of run-of-the-mill uh, violation. All right, so in terms of willful violations, we do know that, yes, they could have fined even higher with a willful violation. However, even when willful, the amount is not enough. These, again, OSHA, federal OSHA is operating under some prehistoric um, uh, standards in terms of their citation system um, that dates back to the 70s. So again, the, the agency itself is completely outdated in terms of its standards and citation system. And in addition to that, there's no real clarity as to how these citations are done in the investigation process of what dictates a willful um, versus serious, which is the case of, of, of you know, when it, in, in this latest case of Smithfield, it's, it was considered a serious um, uh, citation under the general duty clause for Calosha, which means there's no clear standard around infectious disease protections. There's mm -hmm. no infectious disease uh, standard really at the federal level that protects workers. And again, OSHA is in the position of expediting a temporary emergency uh, infectious disease standard, given the reality of current times, you know, mm. this pandemic itself being considered under an infectious disease. So um, if they had the will to really make these changes, um, this would have been expedited and the process would have started months ago. And the truth is that to look at the big picture, not just in the circumstances under COVID, but to the kind of conversation where we were having about the way OSHA operates generally, even bigger fines in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you're a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company like Smithfield, you're sitting there and thinking, eh, that's not out of my pocket. That's the cost of doing business. What you really have to have and the only way workers' lives are going to mean something is these CEOs have to go to jail when these things happen. Because if in the outside world, if you were found to have caused the death of someone, you would be in jail. If not for murder, you'd be there for manslaughter. So what I'm trying to say is that in the outside world, we treat things, the violence against human beings, in a completely different way inside the workplace. It's as if the workplace is this um, sacred, walled-off walled off place where only the CEOs get to decide the behavior, and OSHA obviously lets them get away with it. Right. No, you're, you are right. I mean, it's, it's very it's, it's very few cases that allow the employer to go through some criminal prosecution mm. process. And in the cases where that's even considered, as we know, we, we've had some local cost groups that, that have pushed for that criminal uh, prosecution of employers. Sometimes you have the supervisor, um, which is also essentially sometimes, you know, a, a supervisor in the field that gets the jail time and never the CEO. Mm. So there is inconsistencies in our system. There are inconsistency in the number of, ins of inspectors in, this, in, in OSHA in comparison to the, our, our, our worker, worker industries and how many workers we have out there. I mean, I will repeat this, and I've said this in your show in prior times, Jonathan, is that um, it would take OSHA over 150 years to inspect every workplace. Mm. Um, so that in itself speaks to the capacity of OSHA, um, and let alone now that there's no true willingness to protect workers under this, uh, under the current federal government 
uh, and, and have them enhance the, the standards in place or issue a temporary infectious disease standard that would protect workers across the country. Now, a few weeks ago, you were on the show and you did a fantastic discussion, a fantastic segment and explanation of the fear that workers are confronting out there in the workplace when they try to raise these concerns about COVID-19, about the infections, about the workplace safety situation, that they're not able to essentially be whistleblowers because of the fear that they'll be fired. Doesn't a fine like this essentially suppress that even more and make folks even more afraid now to to stand up and and raise issues? And so these small fines essentially down the road are guaranteeing that more workers will get sick and die. Yeah, and that is the unfortunate truth, is that when a worker sees an employer gets this really minimal citation um, at the expense of worker lives, it only, uh, again, it only amplifies the message that if I even put in a report, uh, complain about working conditions, I am just as disposable as, as the worker whose life was disregarded. Um, so again, it, it, is, it, it does create a ripple effect that only impacts workers and any efforts to create safe and healthy work con- working conditions. Um, the workers con- right now are also really in a really difficult position, given that if they decide to leave their workplace because of the unhealthy and safe conditions, they are also not receiving any economic relief from the government itself. So you're really putting workers in a tough position of deciding, do I stay in my workplace because I, my livelihood and my family depends on it, or do I walk away without any guarantees of economic relief and so forth? Um, and I mentioned this because us at, at National Kosh have really been battling these two areas where we're asking OSHA to do its due diligence, provide protection, also um, supporting workers in campaigns where they're pressuring employers to do their, their due diligence of protections, um, but also requesting and advocating that governors across the country are providing economic relief across the board for all type of workers when they're left with no job or working part time, Mm -hmm. um, because there is also inconsistency with that. As we know that a lot of uh, immigrant workers do not qualify for our systems in place that provide unemployment benefits, paid sick leave, you know, which is another another arena uh, that is very limited in this country for a lot of workers. And the kicker on this conversation, and I'm curious what you thought about this in case uh, you didn't see it, is a spokesperson for Smithfield was outrageously upset about this particular fine. And rather than say, you know, we kind of made mistakes, we accept uh, the government's $13,494 fine, they're going to appeal it. They're going to they're going to protest this minuscule, barely noticeable fine. Right. And thank you for pointing that out. You know, another fail in our system is that these many of these employers that get these citations have the ability to easily appeal these complaints um, and get the, the and, and, and have the citation uh, go even lower than, you know, we don't know. And it takes months for that process to happen. But nonetheless, what we hear in the headlines right now is that Smithfield, who has had worker fatalities, has had thousands of workers infected, receives a 13,000 fine. In a couple months, we will not hear from media that says that if that fine gets cut even half of what it is. And it's, it's really devastating. I mean, it's the devastating reality of the inconsistency of worker protections that are being led by our, our so-called uh, agencies that protect worker health and safety in this country. And then just to make the obvious point, when those fines get cut, it even more says to workers, your lives don't matter any really. Shut up, do your job, don't stand up to the company. Right. So one important thing is that although we know that the government has lacked in the arena of supporting and protecting workers, we have not given up on this idea that workers, when they take collective action, can demand the rights, their rights um, and can't press, uh, pressure employers to provide safe and healthy workplaces. We've seen it across the country through different campaigns. We've seen poultry workers um, who have requested through their petitions, through collective action, whether it's walking out, whether it's a delegation to their direct managers requesting the proper safety and health equipment, 
those collective actions do work. And we do encourage workers that are out there sort of feeling at a loss to, to talk to their fellow work coworkers and see what can we do collectively in creating this demand. Our employer heavily depends on our work. Mm. If I walk out of here by myself, there will be no change. But if I work, you know, if we are able to gather workers together to take that action, you know, again, it takes, it, it, it speaks a thousand in terms of putting pressure into the employer. And as you quite well know, because you work closely with unions, that is the value and the importance Correct. of having unionized a workplaces union. because mm -hmm. you have a voice and you feel like you're together with the rest of your comrades and it's not just you standing up alone against the corporation. Well, Jessica, thanks again for really giving incredible insight into this. And we're going to follow this constantly on this program. We want to have you back. Let's keep after Smithfield and these other uh, companies and obviously get after OSHA to start to uh, really take account of what's happening to workers and bring companies basically, if you will, into the into the dock so that they uh, are, are held accountable. Thanks again and look forward to having you back soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan.